Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, September 11, 2022. We are in the second lesson of our fall quarter, uh, Unit 1 of this quarter, which is entitled, God Calls Abraham's Family. God Calls Abraham's Family. Our lesson title from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly is An Unexpected Choice. Our devotional reading comes from Psalm 75. Our background scripture comes from Genesis chapter 25 verses 19 to 34. And our print passage or lesson passage also comes from chapter 25 verse 19b and 34. Our key verse from the King James Version is Genesis 25, 23, which reads, The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and the two manner of people, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Lesson aims from this quarterly is, or rather, uh, number one, reflect on the long-term impact of decisions made by the characters in the story. Number two, emphasize, or sorry, empathize with the temptation to manipulate situations to one's own benefit. Excuse my computer noise. And number three, Commit to practicing restraint to support the flourishing of others. Our lesson has three major divisions. The first is entitled, The Legacy Continues, and that's covered between Genesis 25, 19b and 21. The second is entitled, Struggling for Supremacy. It's covered between Genesis 25, verses 22 and 26. And then the last is misaligned priorities. That's covered between Genesis 25, verses 27 to 34. Before we get into our lesson text, um, I would like to read the biblical context. And we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the passage or a division by division discussion of our lesson. From the quarterly, the biblical context reads, Genesis 25 marks a turning point, a new era in the legacy of Abraham's family and God's relationship with them. Abraham's early pilgrimage ended with his death and only the promise that the land he journeyed through would be his descendants inheritance verses 1 to 11 record the events of his final years and death through a secondary wife Keturah most likely after Sarah's death he fathered six more sons these sons became the progenitors of various Arabian tribes and fulfilled the promise uh, of generating many nations see that in Genesis chapter 17 verse 4 God's covenant stipulated that Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac would be the heir of God's promise. Therefore, Abraham willed all that he had before he died to Isaac. He also gave substantial gifts to these other sons and sent them away from Isaac to avoid inheritance, conflict, and ungodly influences. We see that in Genesis 25, verses 19 to 36 verse 43 uh, I should say that contains Genesis 25 19 to 36 43 contains the account of Isaac's life and that of the lives of his twin sons Esau and Jacob the text for this lesson Genesis 25 19 B to 34 explains their parental struggle I'm sorry <laughs> prenatal struggle for family supremacy unusual births and the family's dysfunctional nature and God's expected choice of Jacob as the future patriarch. 
So let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, while we realize this uh, historical narrative of uh, Abraham's uh, descendants or genealogy uh, and, the, and the, that of the promised seed uh, might be familiar to us, Lord, we know that there's always something we can yet learn. And Lord, uh, certainly we can learn to trust in your providence, Lord, to trust that though we might try to help you here and again, uh, there's no need for that, Lord. What you have ordained, you will accomplish. Help us to see that in this lesson and help us to learn, Lord, what we should do, Lord, in trusting you and being patient and waiting for you to accomplish all things that you have promised in your time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I said, our first division is entitled, The Legacy Continues. That's covered between verses 19b and 21 of chapter 21. Uh, and I'm going to read the uh, King James Version if I need to switch over to the NIV for greater clarity. I may do that, but let's start verse 19, Abraham B. Abraham begat Isaac. In fact, before I, I, I do that, uh, let me back up just a little bit. Um, kind of hate to start in the middle of a chapter, uh, so I backed up to uh, the beginning of chapter 25. And in the verses between chapter 1 and chapter 19, not only do we read about uh, Abraham's uh, remarrying Keturah and having six sons and no doubt daughters, as well uh, and I just understand he was well over 100 years old uh, when he did this uh, and as mentioned they became tribal leaders in Arabia and he eventually sent them to the east uh, separating them from Isaac and Isaac's inheritance Isaac was the chosen uh, the Lord had said and Isaac shall your seed be called the promise was going to come through Isaac and Abraham was well aware of that. Uh, those verses also cover uh, the final days of Ishmael, his genealogy. He had several sons, and of course they became uh, uh, tribal leaders uh, in uh, Arabia. And uh, he died. Or, uh, Abraham died at 175 years old, a uh, ripe old age, full of years. The Bible says, and. Ishmael died at, and, and of course, Jacob and Ishmael buried uh, their father Abraham in the cave of Machpelah where their mother, where Sarah, where Sarah was um, buried, uh, Isaac's mother. Uh, Ishmael died at 137. And again, uh, Abraham had provided uh, something for him, but he became uh, his own man, of course, in the head of many Ar Arabian nations. Now then, so we let's pick up. So Abraham begets Isaac, and we know uh, where that happens. Abraham is uh, 100 years old. He's already fathered uh, Ishmael by Hagar, uh, Sarah's handmaiden. When Sarah and Abraham got a bit impatient and tempted to help God along, but the Lord reaffirmed that. Uh, his seed, uh, the promised seed, would come from he and Sarah. It would come from his own bowels and Sarah, by Sarah, I should say. So he begets uh, Isaac according to God's promise. Verse 20 says, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Patanaram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. So, um, Isaac, if you recall, um, Abraham had sent uh, his uh, servant Eliezer to back to his home country to choose a wife for his son Isaac he did not want to take a wife uh, from among the Canaanites in which he sojourned 
And of course, uh, his servant, being a wise servant, took 10 camels, loaded down with gifts and provisions. And of course, he whispered a prayer to the Lord to guide him to the woman. And of course, he did at the well. He guided him to Rebecca, who not only asked if he wanted water, but offered to water his camels as well. And of course, Isaac, I'm sorry, Eliezer the next day uh, got right to the point, talked about uh, his master's son needing a wife, and so, you know the story. So Rebecca agreed to, uh, to come with uh, Abraham's servant back to Canaan to marry Isaac. And when Isaac uh, saw her, he was smitten, as you recall, and, and again, they immediately wed. And uh, now fast forward 20 years, they've been wed for 20 years. And it said that Isaac was comforted by his wife. He was comforted in the loss of his mother, Sarah, by his wife, Rebecca. So 20 years later, uh, Rebecca is barren, like Sarah was for some 25 years after God called Abraham between his age 75 and 100. So unlike Abraham, however, um, Isaac did not uh, succumb to uh, a desire to help God along or maybe the insistence of Rebecca to take a handmaid and have a child by, by her, but he entreated, which means he he pleaded with the Lord on her behalf. And God, and of course Isaac knew that he had to have a seed, he had to have a son, a descendant, to fulfill God's promise to his father Abraham. Uh, and, and let me say something about that. While we, we want to be patient and we want to wait on God's timing, uh, sometimes we can desire that that God moved things along. And I don't know that God uh, has any problem with us praying for something that we desire. As a matter of fact, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication. That's our specific request with thanksgiving. Make our request known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And while there's something that God may plan to give you a year from now and it's something you earnestly desire now or in a month or two months i don't know that god uh, will chastise us for asking him for what we desire as long as what we are desire is in god's will his ultimate timing of course will be up to him and we need to be patient and wait for that so um, isaac entreated pleaded with the lord uh, earnestly and continuously, this is in, this is inferred here before the Lord. And what does uh, what does our verse say? Okay, let me let me back up. I'm sorry. It looks like I missed uh, part of twenty, but um, I think you know we we uh, we know that uh, Rebecca was actually uh, his cousin. He was uh, his mother's. She was his mother's brother's daughter. Mother Sarah's uh, brother was Laban. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, um, his, yeah, was Laban. And Laban uh, was the father of Rebekah. And the Bible says, uh, uh, that they, the King James Version at least says that uh, she was of Bethuel, uh, a a Ramian from Padet Aram, again the sister of Laban and uh, Aramine. She was, I'm sorry, she was the sister of Laban, sister of Laban. And uh, uh, that area was actually Upper Mesopotamia, Upper Mesopotamia, which is uh, northeast of the land of Canaan. In the general area of ha Haran, which is where uh, Abraham departed from, he came from Ur to Haran and then Haran into the land of Canaan when God uh, began to show him the land that he would give him as a possession, as an inheritance. Now, back to verse 21. So Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, she was childless, the NIV says. 
the Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant okay the NIV says or conceived the KJV says so God uh, was gracious uh, God certainly had intended to uh, provide allow uh, Rebecca to become pregnant uh, and the fact that uh, the fact that Isaac entreated or pleaded with the Lord may have a I don't know that it adjusted his timing at all. God delighted in him uh, asking for what he desired that was in his will. Now, and what, what Isaac was doing was acknowledging that God uh, was involved in the timing of the seed promised. He, uh, again, knew that the seed was promised. He knew that it was something that was in God's will. And he simply was asking that God would perform his will um, uh, in a more speedy way, even though it had been 20 years. Let's move on to verse 22. I'm sorry, let's move into the second division. But before that, there's a question here, which reads, how significant is the ministry of intercessory prayer in your congregation? And how frequently do you gather for corporate prayer? And I would say not frequently enough. We generally do uh, during Bible studies. Uh, however, uh, during our normal Sunday worship, those times are few and in between. We did have an hour of prayer last month uh, and asked the congregation to remain for that. But uh, I think that probably needs to be done more frequently. And certainly, uh, we need to continue in all of our uh, teaching ministries, our Bible studies, our Sunday school classes, uh, etc. We need to be in intercessory prayer one for another. So verse 22 reads, and this uh, section or division is entitled Struggle for Supremacy. And it's covered between uh, Genesis 25, 22 to 26. Verse 22 reads, again from the KJV, and the child, children rather struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. NIV says, Why is this happening to me? So she went and inquired of the Lord. Now, uh, she doesn't know what's going on, but she knows the babies are jostling a lot in her stomach. Or in fact, she doesn't know that she has twins at this point, I'm pretty sure. Uh, they didn't have ultrasound back in those days. Uh, but she knows she's in pain because something's going on. Or whoever's in there is tumbling and turning flips and what have you. And she says, you know, I'm pregnant, Lord. Uh, why am I feeling this discomfort? This is not normal. What's going on? So she followed her husband's lead and she went to the Lord. And we have to believe earnestly desiring that he would let her know what was going on she went to him in faith in other words wanting to know what was going on verse 23 reads and the lord said unto her two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. So the Lord responds to her earnest prayer about what's going on. And I, I believe that God does not want to keep us in the dark about his will uh, for our lives. Unless in doing so he is trying our faith uh, for some reason. And there's a period in which he simply wants us to trust him whether we can understand or not. So he will keep certain things from us to test our faith. But in this case, she's come to him with an earnest question, and he has responded and given her uh, an answer. And again, let's let's dissect this this answer now. He says, two nations, in other words, are in thy womb, or the progenitors of two nations are in your womb. Two manner of people. Progenitors of two manner of people. 
shall be separated from your bowels or from your innards. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. One of them is going to dominate the other uh, people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now that is a prophecy, of course, that God is going to fulfill. And it is contrary to the traditions of this patriotic, uh, a pat patriarchal, I should say, era. During this patriarchal era, the oldest son uh, got the birthright. A double. We'll say more about this later, but a double portion of the inheritance, and also became the uh, head of the household. Uh, and the, the chief and the priest of the household. But in this case, God uses his sovereign prerogative to flip the script. And he says, the younger is going to serve, um, the older rather, is going to serve the other rather than the tradition, uh, than, than uh, what is traditionally uh, practiced. Verse 24. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now, God had already told her, hey, there are two nations, two peoples, and certainly he, she understood that they, that meant there were the progenitors of two nations or two people in her womb. The days of her fulfillment was the normal gestation period of nine months. Isaac and Esau were born in 2005 B.C., 2005 BC and uh, so she delivered twins two boys uh, we don't know if they were identical twins or paternal twins but we know they were delivered in short order one right after the other as the next couple of verses explain verse 25 and the first came out red uh, all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau, which means red. Also, we're going to learn that Edom means red also and hairy. Um, verse 26, and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and they called his, and they called, rather his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old, or 60 years old, when she bare them. So they got married at, when he was 40. 20 years later, uh, she gives birth to two twins. And uh, the one is hairy. Uh, and so, obviously, they weren't identical. So one was really hairy, like a garment. Uh, and the other was smooth, as we'll learn later. Uh, then they were not identical twins. Uh, so we talked about the meaning of uh, Esau's name, uh, and names were given to children um, uh, that uh, suggested uh, the type character uh, that they might have when they when they grew up. Um, the, the either the, the look or the the actions that occurred during during their birth uh, anticipated future characteristics of of the individuals and then of course their descendants beyond them and we know in this case they were progenitors of nations and I I, I meant to say something uh, earlier about the struggle that was in the uh, going on in the womb back back up to verse 30, 23 for a minute when the Lord is answering uh, Rebecca, uh, this struggle uh, between the two twins in utero, in the womb, was symbolic and it portended what was to come. It was a type of omen or sign of what was to come, not necessarily between these brothers, even though we know there was great conflict between them but between their posterity as well, between the nations that they would would father. Um, in the case of Esau, the Edomites, and we know the Edomites were a plague uh, uh, toward the, for the uh, Israelites for many generations. Uh, and of course, uh, the Israelites from, from, Isa, from uh, 
Jacob, who became Israel and the progenitor of the Israelites until God uh, put an end to the Edomites and their the conflict between the two. So ultimately Israel prevailed as the stronger people of the two. Uh, verse uh, verse 26 again talks about um, the, uh, talks about Jacob taking hold of the second child born, taking hold of Esau's heel and they named it his name was called Jacob and Isaac was three score years old uh, when she bare them now Jacob means <laughs> uh, get ready one who grabs the heel or a heel grabber if you will <laughs> that's what Jacob means or I've heard uh, a supplanter uh, being used to describe Jacob, but it was going to, uh, they gave him that name uh, symbolizing the future, uh, his future prominence over Esau because he grabbed his heel. I, I don't get the full meaning of that, but that's what uh, one of the commentator says here. Uh, now, uh, God, of course, knew the true nature of both men, uh, what they would be, uh, as adults and what their posterity would be but God chooses irrespective of our human flaws uh, we know that they both had human flaws as, as did their posterity but God in his sovereign will chose to work through Jacob as uh, to continue uh, the promise uh, and through this promised seed, one after the other, he would ultimately bless all the families of the earth. And that blessing came through, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross for the sins of the world. The greater son of David, who was, of course, a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I just want to read a few sentences from the commentator. Uh, he says an applicable spiritual principle is that God's choice of those he elects to use are based solely on his will, purposes, grace, and mercy. The struggle for supremacy uh, in Rebecca's womb was a symbolic manipulation of what God had already decreed. Although there will be struggles, tests, trials, adversities, we do not have to fight to get where God wants us. His requirement is obedience and trust in his will for our lives. Every believer is here intentionally for a God-ordained purpose. We want to keep that in mind. We don't have to struggle to try to see that God's will is fulfilled. We just need to be obedient and trusting of God and his will uh, for us, his purpose for us will be accomplished. Another question. Um, why is prayer necessary even when God has predetermined his sovereign will? Because God says it is. He said men ought always to pray and faint not. He says over and over throughout the Bible that we ought to pray. We are to seek him, seek what we desire through him ask for wisdom ask for the spirit ask for what we need and what we desire even though god knows that already he wants us to express our dependency on him and our trust in him to deliver all that we stand in need of let's move on to the third division which is entitled misaligned priorities that's covered between genesis chapter 25 verses 27 to 34 and from the KJV it reads and the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter a man of the field and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison but Rebekah loved Jacob and Jacob sought pottage and Esau came from the field and was faint and Esau said to Jacob feed me I pray thee 
with some of that red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point of de uh, to die, and what profit shall this birthright be to me? Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and I will. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So let's back up again to uh, verse 27. And it says, The boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Um, they grew differently, quite differently. Uh, Esau being a man's man of the field, a skilled hunter. And of course, uh, Jacob being a homebody. As when it said he dwelled in the tents, he stayed home. No doubt learned how to cook from his mom and that cooked up some very delicious stew, red stew. Verse 28 says, And Isaac loved Esau. Why did he love him? Because he did eat of his venison or his deer meat or his wild game. And it was tasty. Uh, and But Rebekah loved Jacob. Why? Because he was a homebody. He was there. He was, uh, he was there to, to listen and to learn and to love on and all of that. So uh, she loved uh Jacob and Isaac loved Esau, and that was, of course, a very dangerous thing that was uh, a main an ingredient for conflict and future heartache. To have, when parents have favorites, uh, they are uh, building in some division and some uh, dysfunctionality within the family. Parents should never have favorites. They should love their children the same. Even though those of you who have who have had multiple children know they can be quite different. Uh, one can be very compliant, the other can be very defiant, and another can be someplace in between. <laughs> so, anyway, so uh, this was conflict that uh, the parents uh, were responsible for. This was not God ordained. We want to be clear on that. And we and it goes on. This is historical narrative here. And Jacob sawed or cooked some pottage. And Esau came from the field and was faint. No doubt, uh, having an unsuccessful hunting trip, or if he had a successful hunting trip, he didn't. He was so faint, didn't have time to dress uh, and cook uh, whatever the game that he had uh, killed. So he is famished. He probably no doubt been out all day. And this stew is smelling really good. Um, verse 30 says, And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with, that, with some of that red pottage, for I am faint. And therefore was his name called Edom. Now Edom also means red. Now he was red and hairy. And he, he sold, as we're going to see in a minute, he's going to sell his birthright for red pottage. So the man is associated with red. And that's why his descendants were called Edomites, because he was nicknamed, the nickname Edom or red. And as we know, uh, people that have red freckles, red hair, uh, commonly get the nickname red. Well, that was, that was Esau for you. Verse 31. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Now, where did Jacob get the notion to ask Esau to do this? Well, no doubt his mom told him about what the Lord told her. Hey, the younger, the older is going to serve the younger. She knew the patriarchal tradition, and that was for the older to, to get a double portion of the inheritance and to be named the head of the household and the chief and the priest, family priest. And so he probably he learned from his mom, oh, I'm not going to go that way with us. So, um, and on the other hand, he probably valued the birthright more than Esau did. 
because he understood that the promise was going to come through his descent, through him and his descendants, the promise of God to Abraham and Isaac. Now, um, so verse 32 says, And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. What And what profit shall this birthright be to me? Now, what does that suggest? Well, Esau didn't really appreciate the birthright, uh, its importance. Um, they were fairly wealthy, and I, I don't know whether he assumed, well, if I get if I get a third instead of a double portion, uh, I'll be fine with that. I don't know what he was thinking, but he d he didn't uh, he d had no spiritual connection or understanding of God's will uh, concerning uh, the promise, apparently, because uh, uh, the birthright, of course, would have made him uh, again the head of household, and you would assume uh, the, uh, the the lineage uh, uh, to. Uh, David and then his greater son would have come through him. And of course, he is exaggerating his uh, his condition. Obviously, he's not dying. He's just hungry. I mean, as many of us have been famished, uh, but he could have waited until mealtime or until um, he got to mama and mama would have fixed him something pretty quickly, I'm sure. But anyway, let's move on. And Jacob swear, Jacob uh, said rather, Swear to me this day, and he swear unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. For what? A bowl of red stew. So he had him swear, and that was, of course, an oath that he, he took before God, that he would give Jacob his birthright for a bowl of stew, pottage red stew. Move on to verse uh, 34. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So when his physical appetite was satisfied, he moved on, not concerned about what he had done not concerned about the fact that he had uh, sold away for uh, a morsel, if you will, for a bowl of stew, uh, his birthright and the inheritance that he would, uh, would have uh, inherited. And he regretted that, as we know gravely. He wept sorely when Jacob not only led again. Now, Jacob didn't actually deceive Esau. He was right up front. He didn't have to do this, uh, but he had, he was right up front, sell me your birthright for the stew. And Esau, unfortunately, was, uh, was uh, dumb enough to do that. Uh, but he did, in, in collaboration with his mother, years later, deceive his father. And again, he did not need to do that. The Lord uh, had already ordained that the young older was going to serve the younger and that one people was going to be stronger than the other. And that was, of course, the younger's uh, posterity would be stronger than the older's. Uh, so he didn't have to do that as Abraham and Sarah did in trying to help God along with uh, uh, Sarah giving Abraham Hagar, this is what uh, I, uh, Jacob and his mother Rebecca tried to do later on with Isaac. And of course, uh, that's something that we need to be wary of. Uh, if we know that God has promised something, and of course the promises, the real promises we can depend on are those that are in his word, uh, what he has promised us in his word. And he's promised those to all believers. We can put uh, we can we can go to the bank with God's promises to his people and just trust him and be patient and for his timing and with his timing and delivering on his promises. But again, we see uh, despite the fact that Jacob was uh, 
deceitful later on as we say when he deceived, deceived his father God used him in spite of that and as I said before God you know if God were, were looking for a perfect person other than the God man the Lord Jesus Christ to execute his will or to deliver the promises through to the world he found none before the Lord Jesus that there were absolutely none that were perfect so God worked with sinful man in bringing in the Lord Jesus into this world in the flesh and then ultimately fulfilling his perfect will because Jesus was perfectly obedient and therefore became the perfect Lamb of God. So in, in summary, and there is a, uh, a final question here uh, which says, what are specific spiritual disciplines necessary to patiently wait for God to fulfill his promises? What are they? Spiritual disciplines. Well, we, we have to pray for patience. We have to pray for um, endurance. You know, um, James says that we are to to pray, he says to pray for patience and, and endurance. With those that the patience doesn't come naturally, but when we pray for patience, we need to understand that some uh, well, very often that comes by way of trials. We look at James chapter one, verse beginning of verse two, and it says, "My brethren, count it all joy." when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So patience is produced by the trying or testing of our faith. But he says, but let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. All right, so I pray that we have understood this uh, historical narrative a little better than perhaps we did before and uh, as always uh, when we go through familiar uh, portions of scripture uh, there's a tendency to say hey been there done that know this but uh, it's been my experience that I always learn a little something more about in this case about God's uh, provision God's providence and certainly the fact that we need to be patient and wait for God to accomplish his will in our lives so, Father, we do thank and praise you again for this lesson. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to study it and to share it with others. And we pray, Lord, that we have understood all that you intended for us to understand about uh, uh, your will and about your providence, about your sovereignty and your sovereign will and election when it comes to election. Lord, And we know that, again, uh, uh, you... Uh, from generation to generation, Lord, you chose a people, and out of that people, you chose a line, and through that line, you brought your Christ, your Son, into the world, Lord, to save the world from its sins, Lord. And we just thank and praise you that through Abraham and through the greater son of David, Lord, you have been, you have blessed all the families of the earth as you did, in, as you promised in, in, in Genesis chapter 12. Again, we thank you and we praise you until such time as we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.